Yo, what's good, y'all? This is Master Ace, Crooklyn Dodgers. You know what I'm saying? Juice Crew and all of that. Check me out coming up on I Only Touch Greatness, the podcast. Looking for the most beers on tap. Great steaks, great staff. Head over to the John B. Pub. We got the best beers, steaks, chicken wings, nachos in town. Come see us at the John B. Pub. The John B. Pub, the best bar in town. Come sign up for our football pool. Say hey, St. You. Turn it up. The number one sports podcast in Vancouver. With Ryan Hayes and Big Mike. Now I'm running through this game lynch. We're taking over the podcast scene in Vancouver. Get down or lay down. One thing, who named y'all the high and the mighty? To me, y'all just sound like a couple of high whiteys. You had to be on mad coke and ecstasy. The thing for a second, you can stand next to me. I, I, I am the man, but I'm not the one with a can in his hand. I'm down with a different kind of street band, and I hear from place to place as the music man, aka Master Ace. Stack. Bed Stuy, Flatbush, Brownsville, Crown Heights, where the music feels good and it sounds right. Yeah. Summertime, music in the park. We can do this in the dark, we don't even need no street lights We bright, look how we all shine We all trying to live, so we all grind And then we started saying Crooklyn Had everybody thinking it was all crime Shouted out to Spike Lee And the dude on the corner in the white tee And the girl off the block with the attitude Had to write a song, show my gratitude Welcome, Welcome to my city, man To the streets where the late Ray Biggie ran and damn near everyone's a Biggie fan That's cause we support our own Brooklyn Brand the gym Hip hop's what we got a big advantage in Ain't rich, not yet, damn, but your man's managing Understands we can't be stopped Get blocked You don't wanna get shot Read my rap sheet, nigga Classics Dikembe Matumbo of this rap shit Understands we can't be stopped Get blocked You don't wanna get shot Read my rap sheet, nigga. Classics. Rikimbe, my tumbo of this rap shit. Anyways, I spit fierce flow so many ways. I've been nice since Piggy Bank, saving my penny days. Before the hypnotic Alize and Henny craze. Way before Barry Bonds. Guess I'm calling this Willie Mays. While you sitting spitting your silly phrase, I've been writing and reciting something that really pays. That long list is what a man wants out of life. The twist is God won't hear him until he prays. I bet you thought that the music man would take a short I fought tooth and nail to prevail in the sport So lend me your ears, my peers, because here's a brother Who doesn't fear another, cause fear's in the mind So don't try to scare, cause you might find a chair Thrust upon your back with a whack, so there I put you in your place and hate, not flee Cause you can't be Master Ace, the music man So, I'm Ryan by the... There? I'm Ryan, by the way. I'm in Vancouver, Canada. I'm joined up, with Ryan? my co-host, Big Mike. He's up here in Vancouver as well. Thank you very much uh, for taking the time for us. And oh, what's up, Mike? And Prince <laughs> Allen, who hooked up this whole yeah. interview for us, is my co-host in Kansas City. So thanks for joining and listening to him. Absolutely. Uh, I love, I love, I love uh, Vancouver, by the way. Oh, really? Oh, dude? right on. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. I, Nice. I would love to. I would love to move out there. Oh yeah. Oh okay. Sweet, sweet. <laughs> uh, we'll get started here. Uh, so, born in Brooklyn. Uh, tell us a little bit about childhood and uh, and what sports you played growing up. I only played one sport really growing up. Uh, well, that's not true. In the neighborhood, I tried a little bit of everything, but I stuck with football because. I had some success when I was really young. Um, I tackled this guy that was like way older than me and the whole neighborhood went crazy and was pick, picking me up and cheering and everything. And at that moment, I was like, I'm going to be a football player. But I still tried I tried baseball. Um, I got a uh, – we joined – there was a team being uh, put together in our neighborhood, like a – I guess it was like a uh, – one, uh, like a little league team, and yeah. the guy, the guy, uh, collected all of the kids' money and disappeared, and and that and that soured me for baseball at that point right there. I was like, oh, 
I mean, it was just a bad experience because, you know, my mom's put the money up and a bunch of other kids, everybody put the money up and the guy just never showed up again. Oh, gee. That's brutal. That's terrible. Yeah. That's, and <laughs> um, what made you first get into music? I mean, it was, it, just, start? it was just in the neighborhood. It was, it was, it was always in the neighborhood. Um, music was a part of growing up in Brownsville, right. Brooklyn. Older guys walking around with big radios playing songs. Um, it was the you know when I came up in the early eighties. Yeah. Uh, it was mostly it was mostly well not late seventies really. It was mostly disco being played. But right. Those are the records that we were hearing on the radio and that we were hearing playing in the park. But it was really those park jams that really got me into music. Um, I was I was I was still young, but I would come out to those park jams and I could stay out there until it got dark. Um, once the, once the lights came on, the, the street lights came on, I had to go in the house, but those were exciting times for me, seeing the older kids in the park dancing, girls smoking and DJs DJing. And that was kind of, the, those are the, those are the earliest memories I have of, of, of music and wanting to be around it. Okay. Right. What well, who was the first one to, you know, the first rapper, because, um, Coming from New York, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's it's got to be crazy at back in them areas, you know what I'm saying? Back in them times, whenever hip hop was first starting. And um, who was the first one that got you into the Juice Crew? Well, I I got into the Juice Crew really by a, uh, it, it was a set of circumstances that led me to the Juice Crew. Um, while I was in college, I, um, into the rap contest when I was home for Christmas break. Okay. I, wa- I wound up winning first prize. And first prize was six hours of studio time with, with Marley Maul. Okay. And so Legend. that's what that's what really got me on that path. I, I, I was, like I said, I was in college. I was working towards my degree. Um, right. My plan was to go out there and, you know, get a get a job. I wanted to, I was, I wanted to go into advertising. So I thought eventually I would, graduate um you know do a bunch of job interviews until i got till i landed a gig at one of these big advertising agencies and i figured i would be mm-hmm. right writing writing beer commercials for you know um one of the one of the big one of the big beer companies that's that's where i thought i was headed okay. and then this rap, and then this rap contest happened and i wind up winning which leads to recording with molly Maul. so i did want to cash in on my six hours right so those sessions, those six hours of sessions led to Marley asking me to keep coming back because he obviously must have liked what he was hearing from me on, you know, with my recording. And so right. I wound up being on his, on his compilation album, Marley, Marley Control. And that's what ultimately led to me being on the song, The Symphony and being associated with the Juice Crew. Right. Okay. So, so The Symphony was the first um, song from, from the Juice Crew that you did? It was the first song, yes. That 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 was the song that solidified me as part of the crew. Okay, correct. Okay, really so is- speaking of symphony too, like how was it at that time making that song? Because like all the songs, like that takes me back. And shout out to my brother because every time he used to always play that song, like. It gets him mm-hmm. amped. He's one of he, he's actually one of your favorites too. <laughs> he was like, Master Ace is all oh, man. Man, you know you gotta you know you gotta do this. You gotta do this, man. Because coming from hip hop, man, I get it from him. So, like, how was it like spinning, you know, doing that symphony? Because like symphony was is so a huge piece of hip hop. And I feel like a lot of people should know symphony like they know everything else. Well, you got to remember, this is very early. This is this is late 80s. So it's very early in the development of, of the culture, of the music. Right. Big Daddy, Big Daddy Kane wasn't yet who he became. Right. Cool G Rap wasn't known and revered the way he eventually became. Um, and so when you're in the middle of it and you're doing it, you don't really think about, wow, this is major. This is a major event. Right, like, right, right, right. Like us having this conversation right now, we're just doing an interview. Right. But 
in 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 20 years you guys become like the hugest the hugest thing in the, in the entire world as far I as hope so. podcasters <laughs> right right you'll, right you'll, you'll you'll look at back at this interview and not realize like how it won't it, it'll be like man that was just an interview it was cool it was whatever but you won't you, you're not looking at it like in the moment that this is a big deal like it's just yeah. something cool that you're a part of that's it yeah you didn't really know what you had there at the moment while you're right there. right <laughs> right and who, and who really influenced you as a music artist growing up uh there was a few there was a few cats um that i heard um i liked a bunch of different people but the cats that that kind of made me adjust what i was writing or how i was writing um one of the first cats was slick rick sweet mm -hmm. um nice and then um ll cool j was definitely one of the cats and then rakim and big daddy kane those are like the four guys to me like my mount rush war as far as influence of course let down the road other people i listened to and got influence from but those were kind of like the main guys that made in my early stages made me change my technique or the way i was writing my rhymes okay did you uh did you ever get to uh, know Park or Biggie very well and any good memories with them? Um not I didn't I never got to know either of them really well. Um okay. but there was like I had people that were close to me that were close to Biggie. So DJ Mr. C was the person who got Big signed and who really brought Big to bad boy to a certain extent he bought he bought big to maddie c at the source which led to big ultimately uh ending up on bad boy so um when when big was uh looking for an attorney to negotiate his uh first contract with bad boy uh mr c reached out to me because he's like yo who who's your attorney i got big on the line who's your attorney i gave him the info and his first lawyer was the same person that I that I used. So it was like pretty little, cool. little indirect stuff like that. But like he we were just different. And he he smoked weed constantly. I, I never wanted to be around weed, so we would never like hang out like that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Just yeah, you know, of course, being from Brooklyn, we had to ask that question. Two, right, like, right, two right. Brooklyn legends. Right. I mean, coming from Brooklyn, you know what I'm saying? Like, um, like Big Daddy came, like how how's like because I I read in like an interview about Big Daddy Kane and um he said um uh, that he kind of doubted you until you came and start spitting like how how's it good like and was you know how was it feeling at that time with um take a look around because to me when I first heard you was like <laughs> me in the biz and when I, once i heard it man and I, I i i was like yo okay this is dope you know what i'm saying because listen as a kid like take a look around is something that was so deep in in this culture and and so you know overlooked and so underrated like tell us a little bit about take a look around I mean, that was my debut. Um, obviously, Marley Marl was the main producer on that album. Right, right. Um, I didn't know. I didn't. I didn't know how to make music yet. I was just learning as I was going along, and I was following really Marley's lead because at that point, Marley had already done so many records with so many different artists. So, right. I I was just I was just a sponge. I was just paying attention. I would ask. I would ask a lot of questions. Why did you push that button? What is that? Why, why did you do that what you know how, how did you make that sound how'd you create that i i just asked a lot of questions um and so that first album was just really me it was like really the it was like the internship for me i was just learning because the records. other side of town because the other side of town like even when you did you like like your like your remake of of your verse on the symphony was like killer yeah thank you um, other side of town, um, that was one of the joints that Marley made, I believe. There was there was like two or three records that Marley made that were actually for Belle Biv DeVoe that they didn't use. Oh, okay. 
um, uh, I, th- That's I think, crazy. yeah, I, I, there was, I use either two or three beats that he made for Bell Biv DeVoe that they didn't use. I, I think maybe Other Side of Town was one of them. Um, oh. Yeah. Would you, what would you say your uh, favorite verses you ever did? My favorite verse I ever did? That's tough. Um, I know you got really, like a lot. <laughs> I know you got like a lot of them. It's just tough because it's, I, I do so much, so many different styles of, of, of rhymes. Like I don't do one thing. So do you have a top five <laughs> or let's go top three to make it easier on you. I think it's easier to just go song instead of verse. So okay. Right, right, and I'll just right. I, I, I'll just pick one from each album, um, like lyr- lyrical performance wise. Um, on my first album, I would say uh, "Can't Stop the Bum Rush," yeah, um, because mm. I was just going straight, straight lyrical, yeah, great, crazy, huh? yeah, straight nuts with it. Yeah. Um, on Slaughterhouse, lyrically, I probably would say uh, "The Mad Ones." Um, yeah, that's sitting on nice. the sitting on Chrome album. Um. I'd probably say Eastbound, maybe Eastbound, something like that. Mm. Mm. Um, disposable Arts, I would definitely say, um, I would definitely say uh, Acknowledge, because that was like mm. a ba- battle, battle, battle rhymes. And then right. uh, on Long Hot Summer, let me see what I got. Because Long Hot Summer, there's almost all the songs were concept songs. Yeah. There, yeah. there, wasn't, there wasn't really one where I was really going in, going in. But um, if I had to pick one, I'd probably say Good Old Love. You know, mm. um, and that's 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 the first five albums. But you know, yeah, give you an idea, which that's the inspiration to 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 me because hearing those songs, like I, I wish I could go lyric lyric for me because it's so much. But I wish I was kind of like that cat. I w- I used to be that cat. <laughs> they will do bar for bar, and hearing that, yo, that's even real, real dope. Like my favorite one off of off of yours, and another one favorite of mine's because I like the whole album. Is as I reminisce because of just the sampling at that time. I don't know. As I reminisce, was just so cool and it's just so dope to me, you know. And talking about a little bit more about that man because um. You know, whenever you did uh, Master Incorporated, was that mm-hmm. just you or was it a whole bunch of group? Because it, it looked like it kind of like was a like a group with you. Yeah, I was I, I was always from the very beginning of my career. I was trying I was always trying to promote the idea of a group concept right. where I was where I was the, 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 the main the main artist. Um, right. So so first I, when I first came out, I, I came out my first single. By myself was ace in action i was trying to create this crew called action and i wanted people to look view me view me as a group so right. that's where the whole incorporate thing came from trying to incorporate other characters other artists other voices into the music um that i was making that's all right. it was right yeah. and, there- and 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 it and tell us a little bit of like how was it getting signed with um you know um delicious um vinyl too because delicious final was was a good huge part of this hip hop thing that we love. So tell us a little bit about that too. Yeah, when I when my deal was up with the other label or or my time was up as far as I could I could see. I could see the writing on the wall. I knew my time was up. Right. Uh my manager at the time was talking to two labels actually delicious final and a and a label in Philly called Rough House. Yeah. And and we had both of those labels um basically bidding and um delicious delicious just made the most sense for me only because I saw that they had already had success with some pop artists, which was Tone Loke and Young MC, big pop yeah. success. Right. And so I f- I figured I could be a change of pace over there. I could be a a different vibe. Right. They had the pop, they had the pop stuff, but they didn't have anything like me. Whereas Rough House was like a, a rugged label. Everybody was just, you know, straight hip hop with, with it boom bap all the way. I just right. figured Delicious was a better route to go. Um, and so that's what made me sign with the label, the label out in LA. 
Right. And um, the first um, Slaughterhouse, man, like, I, I kind of feel like, like, whenever Slaughterhouse made their name, like, they made it on homage of this album because this album was dope. Like, Walk Through the Valley to Late Models, was it Sedan? Yeah, Sedan. Mm-hmm. And G Bass Niggas, which was the first, you know, Born to Row, was Single, you know, yeah. yeah. So, um, like, tell me a little bit about that album. And well, that was the album right after. I, so I was on my own at that point. I, I was yeah, no you was on your own because of cold Marley, chilling no and more, stuff. Yeah, no more Marley. Um, right. So all of the questions that I had been asking that first couple of years. I now had some of the answers. And so right. I knew how I now I now I felt like I knew how to put an album together myself. Right. And I be I became the 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 constructor of this record. And so I brought in a bunch of different uh producers, mostly underground cast that nobody ever heard of, but they had they had heat. Right. And a, a bunch of us were in the studio till all hours of the morning putting together right. these beats. Um and it was it was a real collaborative effort because like one producer would have a dope drum track but no but no loop. Right. And then somebody else would be like, Oh, I'm, I got a loop that can go with that. And then I'll be like, Oh, I got some horns. And, right. and and literally that's how for the most part, that's how that album was made. Just just dudes just putting their two cents in. Oh, you should we should scratch this on that part, on the hook part. Right. And and, and, and it was just a really cool uh um time because like i said i was i was finally on my own and it was i i didn't have to answer to anybody i was really making calling my own shots in terms of how the music sounded yeah because um because <laughs> um jack be nimble too <laughs> I, I actually took a line <laughs> one time and because of hearing hearing slaughterhouse and hearing how much you know what i'm saying you grew on your own and seeing how much you can you know do it by yourself and still kill it is totally amazing because the the album that really really made all of us because listening to you is like listening to everybody else in the golden era y'all always had you know yeah you might have you know master you know master ace but also you have somebody else coming right with you but at the end of the day like you always had like that one song or three songs or the album that stick but you always had an album that stick with everybody so i wish it was with everybody (laughs) well well, to the true hip-hop fans to the true hip-hop fans like me yeah yeah Yeah. i I didn't I, i never i never really caught the attention of the average commercial fan commercial hip hop fan. Um my music right, I mean, wasn't wasn't as accessible for those people. They want they want stuff that's a little bit simpler, easy to easy to digest. Right. Um that they don't have to think too much about. They just want to be able to dance, dance and, and party party. Right. And I didn't really do party I didn't do party records. So right. Right. For, for for that reason it wasn't, you know, it wasn't something that what you had to just know. Like somebody like yourself right. who just knew. Right, but you always fit the category with with some of the ones that I I thought because at the end of the day, if it wasn't for you, you know, <laughs> we wouldn't have you know some of these lyricists right now that's still doing their game until then. I mean, like right now, like you see, like with J Cole with Big Big Daddy Kane, like that's an honor to us. You know what I'm saying? Coming yeah. from loving what we love, you know what I'm saying, and sitting on Chrome. And I love to talk about this, the INC ride. Like, it it felt like you was mixing West Coast with with, um, East Coast, but also, like, but you had your own sound with it. Like, tell us a little about the INC ride. I mean, that's essentially what, first of all, the the version that you're thinking of with the Ozzy Brothers sample, that wasn't the original, that wasn't the original version of INC ride. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That actually was the remix. Remix, um, yeah. And and so the record label heard the remix that I did because the original the original version was made by this this guy named uh, Louis Louis Fat Cat. Mm. And so Louis Fat Cat did the original version, which was which was super dope. Like the the drums, it was like real dry. It actually sounded like some Dilla, so like like some Jay Dilla mm, type, mm. type 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 beat. So right. I loved I loved that version. 
And right. I wanted to, I wanted to roll out with that as the first single, but the label was like, ah, I don't know, this ain't gonna really work at radio. Really? Let's 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 come with let's 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 try to let's try a remix. So I went right. in and put together a remix using the Izzy Brother sam Izzy Brother sample. And when the label heard it, they were like, "That's the single," and they immediately rolled that out and and really pushed Louis Louis Fat Cat's version to the back burner. Made it kind really? of like a. It, his version became like the remix, but if you go back and listen which, to that, which joint, they both both sound hard. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I mean, they're different styles, right? But right, right. To, I I was in love with the Louis Fat Cat version. My my re, to me, my remix was just a remix, but they made it the they made they made that be the 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 actual single. So his 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 version actually became the the remix for 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 most fans. Right. Okay. Yeah. And um and um. And also, I just had to say this one because um, this coming from me, just listening to the B side and then the E sound and Born to Row. <laughs> like, I never thought I would ever say this <laughs> to to the man who made the song, <laughs> right? Born to Row, man, is um one of the all time classic, and I think one of the ones that stuck out in hip hop again <laughs> because we, when we hear it like as in today like what was your influence because I, I kind of know that it's got to be with cars but like was that your influence to making um, Born to Row and, and shout out to my boy um, JR for saying that because he's been wanting to say this too because we was thinking about it yeah I was a car head um in my 20s, I was a big car head. I probably owned like 300 car magazines stacked up in my in my apartment. Um, right. I would cut out the different pictures and just flip through them and look at them, look at different rims and right. sound systems and all that. So I, and I, I had a good friend who I went to high school with who put who put sound systems in cars. Like that's what he did. So right. the combination of that, you know, and and me just loving cause is what made me make write a song like that okay and because because hearing that um hearing that song and it's crazy because 50 cent actually put in on power season two whenever yeah. he was talking to k when Kanan was talking to dre and he was like do you trust your trust your man he was like He's like, no nah, i don't trust my man but then he turned he's like oh fuck it i love this song like how was that you know they still, you know what I'm saying, reviving, you know what I'm saying, making you, you know what I'm saying, these okay. parts. Like, how was that feeling, too, knowing that it was on power? Nah, it was cool. I, I, I got, I've had other placements before that, so. Right, right. It was, it was, it was, it was, it was a cool experience. You know, you get a little bit of money out of it, but for the most part, it was just cool to, to be acknowledged in that way by such a, you know, iconic show of 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 a, of a particular era so definitely right, big right. up big up the, the it, music directors and 50 and whoever else signs off on those things right right because coming from that man it's just um it's crazy because a lot of a lot of people that what makes people want to get back to all this stuff and i love that um um do you got a question bro yeah, well, I'm trying to get one in here. Yeah, I heard you. <laughs> I'm trying to get my bad. I, 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 I know. I, I'm nervous because, man, Master Ace, like, you don't know how much this truly means to me. <laughs> like, this is hip hop to me. Like, I, I wear this shirt for a reason because if it wasn't for me going and sneaking in my brother's crates and listening to sitting on Chrome. To listen to um, doggy style and just not even that, just listening to cats like you and like even the symphony and and um, all these cats, it, it it's truly a blessing to me <laughs> because hearing this and 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 learning about what we love to do most is is the totally the truly type of thing about me and i'm just nervous so <laughs> right. go ahead bro <laughs> okay. you see i had to raise my hand apparently on the yeah. <laughs> fucking it's all love it's all love it, it is you're just showing love for the 
for him. Uh, my question I got for you is if you're having your dream dinner party and you can invite three famous people or other famous people, uh, who would you want to invite, dead or alive? Dinner party, huh? They have to be famous? Well, they not. But, they ain't uh, got to be famous. They can be okay. whoever you want. They can be. be whoever you want. Okay. I would invite my grandmother and my mother. Rest in peace. And I would invite my father. Okay. Because I have a million questions. There's, a, there's, so, there's so many questions that I didn't get to. Look, some of the stuff I didn't get to learn about his life. I don't know a lot about his life. So it would be a good opportunity to ask questions. Pick his brain. Right. Um, do you have a dream? Collab, do you have a dream collab? Um, I wouldn't mind doing something with Joey Badass. I wouldn't call mm, it a dream, a dream nice. but these are just that's artists. Nice. He's an artist that I that I respect and I like what he does and I like his sound. Yeah, I'm um, about to say I I can actually see you and Joey Badass on on the same track because he's hard. <laughs> Do you have a yeah, favorite pick- venue or town that you ever traveled to? It's a few. It's a few cities around the world that I really enjoy when I go. Paris being one. I love Paris. I love Berlin, Germany. Um, I love Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Um, man, I love Sydney in Australia. I mean, that's just a few of my favorites. And Vancouver. There you Vancouver. Go. That's, that's yeah. what we we're hoping for. We're trying to. How yeah. many? How many times have you performed here? Probably five or so. Okay, sweet, okay. Yeah. sweet. Do you remember what venues at all? Or oh man, there's one that I've, there's one particular one that I've been to a couple of times. I, it, I should be able to rattle it off. It would um, have had to probably been plush or something like one of these Co- Commodore. Like, Commodore, nope. big. If you na- if you if you name it, this would yeah. have been like 20, 2012, 2011, 2010, round in there. Okay. Okay. Was it downtown Vancouver? Like down, right downtown. downtown. Yeah. Uh huh. Okay. Uh-huh. I I don't know. There's okay. so many clubs. It might yeah. it might not exist anymore. But yeah, it, that's another thing. They, they 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 open a club. It lasts like two years until there's a shooting, and then they got a new. Nah, name. this spot was around for a while because I I, I came back there like three separate times. Oh, over, Capri, over the, Caprice. The, nah, Caprice. you say no. Richards on Richards, maybe. Richards on Richards. Bar- there you go. Okay. There you yeah. go. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, Mass Day. Okay. <laughs> I was about to say Mass Day is disposable art. <laughs> disposable <laughs> arts. <laughs> Yo, so w- when that came out, because I remember when it came out, right? 2001. 2001. And I I used to always look at in, in you know, the sources and they look, you'd be like, oh, shit, Mass Day's got a new one out acknowledgement was that like a diss record because when i first heard it i was like yo is he dissing somebody and how how dope was it you know what i'm saying at that time because it sounded like you was pretty serious about it like how was it making that out you know album and how how was it and tell us a little bit details about the acknowledgement acknowledge yeah acknowledge was definitely a diss record there's no secret about that i'm yeah. surprised you i'm surprised you even questioning it because i thought i made it very clear that i was going at dudes i even right. said dudes names so <laughs> right no, right right there's, well there's, at that time yeah. at that time when i first heard it like i i didn't know who it was <laughs> i was probably, like yeah, probably because i wasn't dissing people that were known necessarily known. yeah yeah they, yeah they were like kind of kind of more underground people um but yeah it was which and, it was a and, killer song <laughs> I, I felt bad for them cats. Whoever it was, <laughs> I just like, yo, I feel bad for whoever made him mad that day because that was just, that was, hey, I would be, <laughs> I know I would be feeling real bad, you know? Uh, but to answer your other part, other part of your question, yeah. um, to, to make that album, that, that album was like, uh, that's the most important album of my career. And I just say that because it was the first time that I truly mm-hmm. didn't have to answer to a record label or an executive or, or anybody. I literally went in and made the, right. the, the record that I yourself. wanted to make. 
and yeah. and and I I truly thought it was going to be my last album, so I wanted to make sure that it was exactly what I wanted. I didn't want any influence from anybody. I didn't want anybody putting anything in my head. Just be quiet and let me make this record. And so right. when I did that record and I did it the way I wanted to do it, to, to my surprise, it really took off with the fans. And then all of a sudden, um, I had this huge new fan base that I didn't have before, especially over in Europe. And from that point right. that I dropped that album, I've been, I've been touring through Europe because of that album, really. Um, that album has extended my career for 20, 20 years plus, 20 years plus. Right. And do you have a fear of right. pieces, sports memorabilia or not sports memorabilia, but em any memorabilia, like a record or a plaque or anything you ever got? I got, I have so many soccer jerseys from different parts of Europe. I don't even know the teams, but a couple of, I have at least three germ, uh, German teams um i think i have one from switzerland one from the uk i i just collect them some of some of the fans cool. they, they 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 put they they personalize them and put my name on the back of a couple of them okay. um but like i say i don't follow soccer like that so i didn't i don't know the teams but i got them all hanging up in the closet most of them are too big they're like xls and stuff so i'll never wear them but pretty yeah. cool uh, I know absolutely a lot of times uh i know for vancouver a lot of times when people come they hook them up with a jersey or some kind they get them a jersey of some kind to that way they're playing to the home team so was that you like traveling through europe and each one of the home cities gave you something not each one but just certain 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 uh fans in certain cities over the years would just come to the come to the show and just you know present me with a gift which is always nice um and i keep them all man they're, they're hanging up in the closet most of them are like i said too big to wear um, but I, I definitely keep them all. What's it, uh, what's it like being regarded as uh, Eminem, one of Eminem's favorite rappers? And, uh, have you ever had the chance to actually work with him or meet him? Yeah, I met him a couple of times. Um, I met him a couple of times. Was, um, one was on Shade 45, wasn't it? Cause I remember hearing that on the radio. Yeah, that was, that he was, was spit yeah. a bar. He was spinning your bars. <laughs> yeah. That was like a years after we, we actually met in person though at, at his show, um, he was he was on the Up and Smoke tour. Yeah, that which mm -hmm. was um, Dr. Dre, Ice yep. Cube, uh, um, Eminem. I can't remember who else was on. Eminem. There was there Ice Exhibit, Cube, Pot, Exhibit, C, yeah. Jazz and Corrupt were there. Corrupt, right, yeah, right. Yep. Snoop. Yep, yep. So I met him around. I met him at. He invited me uh, through his man through his road manager. Invited me to the show, the one they had in Long Island, New York. And so oh, I drove sweet. out. I, dro I drove out there, and um, they told me that after his set, because he was he was like basically one of the openers. Like he wasn't even like a huge yet. He was yeah, yeah. <laughs> he was going before all those guys, and um, ultimately they said once he's off the, once he's off stage, come meet, come to this door, and they're gonna let me in. And I went, I went over. I, my, my wife was with me, but she she stayed in, in her seat. I went down. They walked me back. And just me and him in the dressing room, just talking, just talking. It was cool. Right. Did you did you actually do a um, song with him too? I'm on a song with him. I wouldn't say I did a song with him because yeah, yeah, okay. we weren't in the studio together. But um, there's right. a song called Hellbound that that uh, right. was on this on this compilation called Game Over. Right. And he had recorded this verse uh, for these producers years before. Well, not years, but like two two years before he actually blew up. Right. He right. Uh, record, recorded this verse at the studio in Queens, which is the same studio that I was working on. I ultimately oh. did did disposable arts in, but oh. they had they had this Eminem verse that was like they hadn't used yet. They didn't know what they were going to do with it, and so we created this song. They decided to create the song Hellbound and put it on this compilation. Right. So I, Sweet. yeah, I wonder, yeah. So um, I, um, I, I would, I'm going to say this too. Um, what? Go ahead. Yeah, I was wondering. I was going to say. I wonder if that's kind of how. The Eminem and Biggie song "Dead Wrong" came about too. It's possible. It's possible. Um, but you know they they were they they came about in the era. They were already in the digital era when M dropped. It was already digital era. So at that point, you could record a record a verse and email it to somebody. Yeah. Like when when I did Hellbound, 
nobody was emailing verses. Like you had to like be in the studio and record it. So I don't know how it was done, but more than, more than likely it was probably through email. Yeah, that's for right. sure. Right. And you was on um the curriculum. It was a part of the Lynn Dodge. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. And so um, how was it working with, you know, special ed and, and them on that song, that classic song, and, you know, on, on Crooklyn? Like, tell us a little bit about that. I mean, it was cool. It was, it was, a, uh, I got a call from Q-Tip saying, asking me if I wanted to be a part of this song for Spike Lee's movie. I said, absolutely. Uh, we all met at special ed studio called the Dollar Cab Lab, which is on, um, I believe, Utica Avenue in Brooklyn, New York. Sat sat down, we listened to the beat. Everybody went home and wrote their rhymes, recorded them. I think we came back to the Dollar Cab Lab and recorded the vocals. And then um, Spike Lee heard it and he's like, you know, the song is cool, but it's not really reflective of the movie. Um, the movie takes place in the 70s. and You guys need to see the movie. So he set up a private screening for about 15 of us, 20 of us. And uh, we watched the movie. It was, it was months before the movie even hit theaters. But we got to see the movie in its entirety. And then he said, now go back and rewrite the rhymes based on what you saw because, you know, it needs to reflect the 70s. So we all went back and rewrote our rhymes. And that's the song that you know as Crooklyn Dodgers. Okay. And what are you up to these days? Man, um, I got two writing projects that I'm working on. One is a, one is a TV series, but the one that, you know, this is just writing projects. But the, the, the other one, which is a little bit more of moving a little bit faster, is this musical that I've been working on. Um, I've, I've uh, partnered with a, a, a hip-hop theater company called Rhymes Over Beats, mm-hmm. and they are basically the catalyst to me getting this thing written and completed. Um, so I meet once a week uh, with, with this, this lady named Kate Camerata, uh, we meet once a week over the over Zoom. Um, we read what I've most recently written. We discuss it. She gives me feedback. And then I go back and I work on whatever we talked about and make it better. So in March of 2020, right before the um, lockdown thing happened, yep. we, had a, we, had, we had a tape. We had a table read where actually actors actually came in and sat down around the table and read, read, read the script. We got to hear the script. Um, out loud, which was which was kind of helpful for me, because it was definitely stuff like, "Oh, that doesn't that sounds corny, or that sounds cool." Um, but I was able to take that feedback from those actors and go back um, and fix stuff. I'm still fixing stuff, um, but at that point, right from March 2020 is when I started working on the music. I started writing the songs, and so I got the songs to a point. I'm probably about three songs short of finishing all of the music, mm. um, okay. but I'm now back working on the script again because I had to make some a couple of major changes to the plot. So I worked, I had to work on that. But it's a process. I'm learning it. It's, it's something new for me. I'm enjoying it. Um, and yeah, that I, I can't tell you when that's gonna come out because, like I said, I've been I've been working on it for at least almost three years. Yeah, almost oh, yeah. three years. Okay. And um, and, um, and I want to say, how was it working with MF Doom too? Because you had MA Doom. Um, how was it working with MF Doom and RP MF Doom? Yeah, we we again we didn't actually work together just like oh, you didn't? The situation. We no shit. So he put out a he put out an instrumental series called Special Herbs. Right. All his all his instrumentals from all his releases, anybody that he ever did a beat for, he took okay. all those instrumentals and put them out. I a friend of mine, uh put me onto these instrumentals. I got my hands on them, started listening to them and decided to just write, a, do a mixtape over some of the instrumentals. And right. that's how it all got started. It, it ended up being a full album once, once uh, Fat Beats Records got involved and they had money right. and they wanted to turn it into more of an official release. Um, and so I, me, Doom and I had a show together at the Montreux Jazz Festival, very famous festival in Europe. Um, it's been around for f- probably 50 years, uh, but we we uh, we were on we were on that show together, and we met backstage. I told them I've been working on this on this mixtape. Well, I said album at that time because it was already officially an album. Right. Um, so after the show, went back to his hotel room and played him the whole album, 
and he loved it. You know what? Nothing was mixed, but he got to hear the songs. And then I said, it'd be dope to have you on a joint. He's like, no problem. And five, six months later, he gives me his verse and the album is done. And that's pretty much how that went. Wow. And that's how do you sweet. Want, how do you want your legacy? It's the last question I got for you. How do you want your legacy to be remembered? Um, I, I hope that people say that I made a contribution to the culture that was a positive one. Um, that I tried to do music that uplifted young people, that uplifted uh, marginalized people, um, and that spoke the truth. Um, you know, probably the easiest thing to do is make party records, which that's no knock to anybody who does party records, but right. I just felt like that wasn't my calling. My calling was something else. Right. And my calling was to try to make music that that lifted spirits that, that that made people think and so hopefully i hopefully i've people will say that w- when it's all did. said and done that, that they'll say that i that i accomplished that right which you 100 percent they will which, which you did because uh, you made one of me man because if it wasn't for you man listening to all those good and timeless music even with the one i'm about to hit you with now uh, a brooklyn story story which with you and marco polo was truly a blessing because you got to talk about ms you know with you know with multiple sclerosis how was it like making that song with feral monk because tell you the truth man when we listen to hip-hop and stuff and we get that action and hearing about that because my mom passed from dementia. So I I know how it, it you want to take it. And I tell people to let let that go, you know what I'm saying? Because that's how you you that's how you do it. So tell us a little bit about that song. Well, um the the idea, the concept for the song actually didn't come from me. It came from uh a rapper named MC Paul Barman. Um, you might might know his voice from Disposable Arts album because he played my right. roommate on one of the skits. Right. But but he and I stayed cool all over the years. And so we were speaking on the phone one day and he hit me with the idea of, yo, you know, I think you should do a do a song where, you know, you're having a rap battle, but the the, the opponent is MS. And I was like, that's that's actually a dope idea. Right. Because that was a dope idea. Like, like I seen that concept and I was and and I heard it and I was like, wow, that changes for anybody that has multiple sclerosis. Right. So I didn't I didn't have a beat for it at the time, but I just kept it. I kept his idea in the back in, in, in the back of my mind. And then there was one particular beat that Marco Polo that I had of his that I didn't know what to do with. And I was like, maybe this is it. So I, I had him rearrange it a little bit, change, change the structure of the beat a little bit, which he did. And then it was like perfect. And I laid my verse down and then we were trying to figure out, you know, who, who could be the opponent on the record? Who could, who could personify multiple sclerosis as an MC? Right. And Far- Farrell March was the clear, clear choice to, right. to pull it off. And he, of course, he did it brilliantly. Right, he did brilliantly. And and another song from that is Man Law with Styles P. Yo, um just hearing those songs, man, and then hear you go back to your bar, you know what I'm saying? Like how you just straight ripping and kill it. Like, what was your favorite song off that off that album? And tell us a little bit about that, um, Styles P. Yeah, the my favorite Track. song of Brooklyn Story is tough. That's tough. Um I don't know. Oh shit! No, no. It, it might, it might be get shot. It might be get shot. Uh, yeah. It, it might get be shot. Sunken. Was going. That was the, might, that was going. That was the other it, one. It might be sunken place. It might be Brooklyn. Mm. It's one of those. One of those three. I I love almost. Every, you know what? I know. I know. I know the answer. <laughs> the answer. The answer is. Still love her. I still love her. That's the record. Uh, uh, that was kind. Of, that was kind of the old to the common record. I used to love her. I, I did a. I did a. Yeah. Yeah. A, yeah. A update updated version of the same version. concept. Yep. Yeah. 
So hey, yep, master, that- hey, master Ace, I want to thank you so much uh, for taking the time for us today, man. We really do appreciate it. It meant right, a lot to us. Right. So thank you so much. Yo, thank yeah. you. Thank you. Because this is hip hop and that's what we love doing. We love to give you your flowers and your roses while you're here. And I just thank you for everything, man. I appreciate y'all, man. Thanks for uh, invi- just- inviting me on the show. Looking for the most beers on tap? Great steaks, great staff. Head over to the John B. Pub. We got the best beers, steaks, chicken wings, nachos in town. Come see us at the John B. Pub. The John B. Pub, the best bar in town. Come sign up for our football pool. Say hey, sent you.